Can you hear my voice from here or would you prefer that I use the mic? Mic, okay. Let's hope the mic. Yeah, I think that's this is fine. So, <clears throat> thank you so much, uh, Frederick. Thank you so much, Father Mervyn. Uh, and thank you, Collaborative Learning Cafe, for making this possible today. It is, I, I'm really privileged to be here. I'm very happy to be here because this is a subject now what not the IS but encouraging Goan youth to sit for the civil service civil services examination is something extremely close to my heart you see Goans were known to participate in public life right from the Gaonkari Sabhas and even during the time that we were a colony, Goans held big posts in other Portuguese colonies, in Angola, in Mozambique, in Timor-Leste, Guinea-Bissau. But somehow or the other, after liberation, the Goans who took part in public life seemed to be people who were outside Goa. But Goans from Goa, for some reason, have not been taking part in the public life of the country, which is unfortunate because we have all the raw material, a high literacy rate, a lot of young people going in for higher education, and it is the civil services are important from a social point of view because it gives us uh, all a chance to participate in the public life of the country and contribute towards it. So it is the good of the community. And from a personal point of view, a career in the civil services offers you an excellent career choice. Now I'm here to, I'm going to assume that you know nothing about the IAS. And I'll begin from that. Okay, because some of you must be knowing about the services, not only the IAS, but all the civil services, uh, the class one civil services of the government. So I will assume you don't know, and I will talk to you from that point of view. And while I'm talking, I'll talk to you for about half an hour, 40 minutes. While I'm talking, now this is an interactive session, okay? So feel, please feel free to ask me questions whenever you want to. But just for the sake of convenience, while I am talking, only ask me a question if something I am saying is not clear, I have used a word or a phrase that you haven't heard. So you just want a clarification, please ask me while I am talking. But if it is a question for information, more information or some other viewpoint that you would like to know, then reserve your questions to the end of my talk. I will be here answering all your questions for half an hour after I have finished speaking also, okay? Now, what is really the IAS? Sardar Patel said in, in uh, Parliament when the constitution was being framed that the IAS is the steel frame of India. And why did he talk about it? Because before the precursor of the IAS was the ICS. It was called the Indian Civil Service, you see, which uh, was very old. For over a hundred years, the, the Indian Civil Service was almost hundred, about 90 years, the Indian Civil Service was, was, was in existence. And it was part of the administration. And there was a demand when India became independent in 1947, there was a demand to abolish the ICS. Because you had all these ICS officers everywhere who actually, uh, you know, put many of the freedom fighters into, into jail. Uh, and because they were just following the, the, the requirements of, uh, of, of government. So many people said, no, 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 they were all uh, uh, against the freedom movement and therefore they should all be, it, it should be dispersed. Uh, but dispersed. But Sardar Patel said, no. They, the, IC, the, the ICS was simply doing what any administrator has to do 
which was manage the administration and the government that was there. And when India becomes independent, the ICS will serve the new government as well. And in fact, the ICS and its uh, uh, subsequent avatar, the IAS, will be the steel frame around which we will maintain the administration of the country. Now, you know, there is, there are two things. You have the political executive and you have the bureaucratic executive. The political executive is the political party in power, which comes to power through elections. And that government can change in the next election or it can be re-elected to power. This happens at the central government, this happens in the state, this happens everywhere. Now you have the bureaucratic executive, which is actually the administrative machinery of the country, the whole administration. Now this administration does not change with elections. An election will happen, the political, a new political party may come to power, but the administration, the officers in the administration don't change. Unlike in some countries, like in America, certain top people do change, etc. But in India, we have a permanent executive. So the permanent executive remains the same. Now, the, the topmost service in this permanent executive is the IAS. The permanent executive helps to implement the... It, in, in fact, it implements the policies of the government and it helps the political... Uh, executive to frame policy, to work out programs, projects, schemes. Ultimately, it is the political executive that takes the decision, but the administ administrative machinery assists the political executive. Now, there are, again, two, two parts to this civil service. One is the All India Services and the other are the other central services. Now, the All India Services, there are only three All India Services. The IAS, which is the Indian Administrative Service, the IPS, which is the Indian Police Service, and the IFS, I am not talking about the Foreign Service, I am Indian Forest Service. These are the three All India Services. Now, what is the meaning of an All India Service as different from a Central Service? An All India Service is a service that is cadre based and each state has a cadre. You know, we in India, we are not a unitary state. We are a federal country in which we have states, 27 states and union territories that make up the country. Because we are a large country with different languages, different cultures, and so we have chosen this form of government to manage ourselves. And each state government, each state has a cadre. Now, Goa is an exception. I'll explain the exceptions to you later. But each large state has a cadre. So, and why? Because the administration has to be carried on in the language of that state. And also, each state, because you know that we have in the constitution the, the, the uh, central list and the state list and the concurrent list, and state governments can make their own laws in, with, under, in, in uh, certain subjects and so each the laws may differ from state to state and so you have in the administration you have to have a dedicated cadre of people who know the laws of that state, who know the language of that state and can conduct the field administration of that state in that language and according to those laws. And so each state has a cadre. So they have a cadre of IAS officers, they have a cadre of, of, and of police officers and of forest officers. But strangely, these officers, their terms of service are controlled by the central government. And the central government itself has no IAS officers. It has no IPS officers, no forest officers. The entire central government works on deputation. So every IAS officer in, which, in the state that he is in generally would have to go on two or three deputations to the central government at various levels. Like I myself, I was allotted the Madhya Pradesh cadre after being selected to the service. So all my field work as SDO, as additional collectors, project officer, tribal welfare, as collector, 
all this field work i was in madhya pradesh then i went on deputation to the central government to the ministry of forest and environment i did my term there then i came back to the state then in the state i was housing commissioner other jobs registrar cooperative societies etc again i went to the central government and i was in the bhaba atomic research center and then i was in the commerce ministry and then again i came back to the state so the entire central government works on deputationists from the state okay and what are the central services all the other class 1 services are the central services the central services are those which are not cadre based so they are the foreign service they are the audit and account service the income tax service the customs and excise service the uh, railway traffic service so these are all there are about a dozen of these services they are all class 1 services of the government but they don't have state cadres they come directly under the central government they are called the central services now fortunately fortunately the selection procedure for all these services is the same so if you want to become a customs officer or if you want to become an income tax officer or if you want to become a police officer or a foreign service officer a diplomat or if you want to join the ias you don't have to sit for different exam sorry this button hole is actually it's intriguing but it's actually a, a recorder which <laughs> rico wants me to wear here anyway so you don't have to sit for separate examinations it's a single examination that you sit for and depending on how you do you get a rank how all that happens also i will explain to you and then according to your rank you can choose which service you want right in the beginning when you fill your application form they will ask you to give a list of services in order of preference and you can put in 10 services you can put in 15 services you can give what generally people put the ias at the top and then they put the foreign service and then they put the police service but it's up to your individual choice what you would like to do like i did not put the police service as a choice at all because i feel that i am not mentally cut out to wear a uniform so but it depends on you you can choose whatever service there are some people who may give Uh, the foreign service as their top choice or there are some people who may give the income tax service as their top choice so whatever you like you can put in all the your, your the the services over there and uh, uh, then according to your rank and the reservations or there are also reservations for scst etc you can get you get the service of your choice depending on the vacancies also there in a particular year now the ias is a generalist service now what is the meaning of a generalist service meaning now the income tax is a specialized service if you join that service you will always be dealing with income tax issues the police service is a specialized service if you join the police service you will always be dealing with law and order uh, similarly any other audit and accounts or railway traffic you will therefore you will be in the railways now in the ias the ias is a generalist service so its main job is to supervise to monitor and to coordinate so in the ias you can be in any department you may be at one time in rural development then you can get transferred to urban development you can get transferred to education you can get transferred to health now each of these departments will have experts in that department but in the ias you are you are specializing in management in coordinating in coord in 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 supervising and monitoring so therefore generally ias officers go in at the top and they coordinate these efforts in that in the particular branch where they are so they may be in education for 3 or 4 or 5 years then they will move Uh, into health and they can move into as i say urban development whatever you like so the ias also offers you a lot of variety variety but also challenges because the moment you get into a department within 2 or 3 months you have to understand 
that department, how it works, what the particular culture in that department is, what are the particular priorities that are there. But the IAS brings to these, many people criticize and say, oh, what does an IAS officer know? He's coming from out. What will he understand about how health works or how education works? But you know, the fact of the matter is that development is also multifaceted. We all require a combination of development. We require a good education system, we require a good health system, we require uh, industry that performs, we require municipal services that work well. So even life is a combination of all this. And the IAS officer brings to the table his coordinating ability because he has worked in a different department earlier on, now in this department. So his job or her job and, and, and why I'm saying her job, because uh, in, in, the, in the last, uh, in the last uh, uh, selection to the IAS, without any reservations, 51% of those selected were women. So uh, you, they, they, this latest batch of the IAS, the 2021 batch, actually had a majority of uh, women candidates, which is a big change. When I got in in 1980, out of the 120 of us or so, there must have been only about 20 women and 100 men. But now see, 51% of the batch is women. So, yeah. Now, uh, uh, so I was explaining to you what the IAS does in terms of, of, of uh, coordinating. Now, how does one become an IAS officer or an officer of any of these central services? Now, there is a very simple eligibility. Eligibility is graduation. You have to be a graduate from a recognized university. It can be anything. You can simply be a BA, you can simply be a BSc, a BCom, you can be a doctor, an MBBS, you can be an engineer, a B, you can be a lawyer, whatever you like. But graduation is the minimum requirement. Of course, the level of papers, etc. required have to be a little deeper than just a regular BA, but the requirement is graduation and age limit between 21 and 32 for general candidates. Then there are reservations. SCSTs can, they get three years more, so I think it's 35, then uh, defense pers ex defense personnel, handicapped, something like that. So it can even go up to 36 years of age. Okay, but otherwise, but retirement age is the same for everybody. So, irrespective of the age at which you get in, uh, everybody will retire at the age of 60, at least at the moment. They may increase the age. When I joined the service, the retirement age was 58, but after about 6-7 years, the whole thing changed to 60. So, by the time you get in, it may change to 62 or whatever. But retirement age is the same for everyone. So, naturally, those who get in at a slightly younger age have a better chance of reaching higher because everybody retires at the same age. But between 21 and 32, you can sit for the exam. And there are six attempts that you can take. SCST, nine attempts. So I mean, the, you can at keep attempting the exam. Whether you should or not is another matter. We'll talk about that at the end. Now, the selection procedure. See, the IAS is not many people you may hear, oh, he he's passed the IAS exam. But there is no such thing as passing the exam. It is a competitive exam. So what do I mean by a competitive exam? It means you, a certain number of people are going to be selected in a year. So you have to do better than others. So even if you get 90%, but if the other person gets 91%, the other person is selected. And even if you get 45%, but if no one else has got 45 and everybody has got less than 45%, you will be selected. So it is actually a competitive exam. So there is no such thing as passing or failing. Everybody will pass, you know, I mean, the vast majority, whoever is sitting, they are serious about the exam, they'll all score high. But you have to score more than the other person. That's what I mean by competitive exam. And if, now, if you look at the numbers, the numbers may sound a bit frightening, but they are nothing to be frightened about. I'll tell you why. Over 10 lakh people apply for the IAS, 10 lakh, 1 million people apply to sit for the exam. 
of course now this is a tiered exam there is uh, the preliminary exam and there is the main exam and then there is the interview so this multi layered selection process we'll find because 10 lakh people cannot be examined as you know properly now of course all 10 lakh don't sit for the ex sit for the preliminary exam uh, the last the average statistics are about 60% of these sit for the exam so in the last 2 or 3 years i was just checking up the figures about 5 to 6 lakh people actually sit for the preliminary exam in the preliminary exam i'll tell you what are the papers etc but 98% of the people are eliminated at this point and only about 2% are allowed to sit for the main exam meaning about 10 to 12000 people out of all those 6 lakhs the top 10 to 12000 people are allowed to sit for the main exam now in the main exam also again whatever the papers etc i will explain to you what they are but in the main exam then out of these 10 to 12000 they will call only the top approximately 2000 people for the interview so you have to be among the top 20% of these in order to get a call for the interview and finally in the interview they will the number will be halved to about 1000 people 1000 people all not getting the ias the top 100 120 will go into the ias but i am talking 1000 people meaning all the services put together all the class 1 services of the government of india which are all good career choices it's not necessary that everyone has to become an ias officer yes if you are lucky if you want it and if you score among the top 100 120 you will become an ias officer but the other services i explained to you are also good career choices and there's another good thing suppose you have set your heart on becoming an ias officer but you don't know now i have and i've got also i haven't yet made it i haven't made it to the ias but i have been selected to the income tax so what should i do now if i don't take the income tax even this will go out of my hand what is the guarantee that next year i will get into the ias but the good thing is that they allow you to choose your service join the service and sit for the ias again of course uh, you're not given separate time to study and all that but uh, you have to do that on your own time but you don't you, you don't have to let go of a service to which you have been selected so you can choose that other service sit for the ias exam again and try your luck if you get into the ias then you switch to the ias or the ips or foreign service or whatever you want and if you don't get it you can continue in the service that you actually have got so that accommodation is also there now to tell you about the structure of the papers okay the preliminary exam where i said everyone who applies and if you qualify if you are a graduate if you are within that age group uh, and if you are an indian citizen they have to allow you to sit for the preliminary exam the preliminary exam consists of just two papers and they are multiple choice papers so you don't have to write long answers or anything you have just tick 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 one paper is a general studies paper like a general knowledge paper in which there is everything there is history geography um uh, and uh, economics and uh, uh, environment and uh, um, a little bit of uh, analytical th- uh, mathematics and uh, you know those things but the level of all this is about 12th standard because they don't expect everybody to be a graduate in all the subjects possible you see it's a general knowledge paper and uh, you, though you are a graduate you are a graduate in a particular subject so this general knowledge paper is more or less the 12th standard if it is actually dealing with the subject but then lot of current affairs and international affairs which are in the papers that also in general knowledge you all have participated in general knowledge quizzes and all so you know what all this is about so there's that general studies paper it's a 3 hour paper and you sit for it and there is a second paper called the aptitude paper the aptitude paper involves comprehension logical thinking uh, analysis 
data, how, how, how you can understand data, graphs, what you make of it. Now, the other thing is that this second paper is only again a qualifying paper. You have to get 33 percent in this second paper. So again, whether you get 33 percent or you get 90 percent, it doesn't make a difference. You have to only qualify in the aptitude paper, but the general studies paper, the marks that you score in the general studies paper will be used for the merit list and in this you have to come, you have to aim to be in the top 10,000. In fact, I would say less than the top 10,000 because the 10 to 12,000 include the reservations which are about 25 percent reservations. So, if you belong to the SC or ST candidate uh, category, then you can manage, but if you are in the general category, then you have to aim to be in the top 9000 to be get a call to sit for the main exam. Now, generally this preliminary exam is held around June. The, 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 the prelims were held this year, I think on the 5th of June, on Sunday the 5th of June, they held the prelim exam for the 2022 selections. The whole procedure takes about 9, 10 months, you see. So, you do your prelim exam in June, by September, by uh, July or so, they will, within a month, month and a half, they will tell you if you have been selected for the mains. The main exams are generally held in September of the year, September, October. Now, due to COVID, it got a bit uh, upset last year, but September, October. Now, in the main exam, this is the real challenge now, because now there are all serious candidates who have come to the main exam. In the prelims, you see there are, uh, as I told you, every kind of, because un uncle is saying sit for it, auntie is saying sit for it, and people sit for the exam, whether they like it or they don't like it. And then they get other career options, they do that. But the main exam, you are uh, facing uh, a good deal of competition because they are all serious candidates. The main exam consists of nine papers, okay, nine papers. Of these nine papers, four are general study papers. Again, they are like general knowledge papers, but they all have a different focus. One general studies papers focuses on history and geography history of India, freedom movement, general geography. Again, as I am telling you, these general study papers again are about 12th standard level. They are not graduation level because they do not expect you to be a graduate in everything. So, the essential thing is 12th standard level, but good solid 12th standard huh? like uh, the ICSC or CBSC syllabus, that 12th standard, not necessarily the state board. So, you will have to check up, use NCERT books for this level. So, history, geography, Indian culture. The second one is polity, that is basically governance, politics, the political setup of the country, constitution. You do not have to know the constitution of India front to back, no. But you have to know important things. You see how is government constructed? Rico, this cover is going off constantly. Again, let me put it on. So, you have to know how, you know, what the Rajya Sabha is, what the Lok Sabha is, what a state assembly is, you know, that kind of thing, your basic civics, political science that you would have studied. The third paper is science and technology, economic development, environment, and you have to know physics, chemistry, but again, 12th standard level, not graduation level, okay? And the fourth paper is ethics, integrity, uh, aptitude, again, analytical reasoning, logical thinking, they test this. So, there, these are these four general study papers. Sorry, sir, you, you wanted to ask me something, sir? No, I thought I saw your hand up. So, uh, uh, four general study papers, each of them 250 marks, three hours. Uh, there is, in these general study papers, uh, uh, there is negative marking too. So, you can't just keep guessing answers. So, for every right answer, you get a certain number of marks, but if you guess a wrong answer, then uh, 
they, you, you get a negative marking of one third the value of those marks. This is to prevent people from doing too much guesswork. Yes, sometimes you can guess logically also, which you must do, but just a stab in the dark, it's not worth doing. Now, these are the four general study papers. Then you have two optional papers. Now, by optional, it doesn't mean that you can take them or you need not take them. They are compulsory, but you can choose the subject. You can opt for the subject. You can, they have some 20 subjects. And you can choose for any one of those subjects. History, political science, geography, medicine, mechanical engineering, civil engineering, electrical engineering, uh, anthropology, sociology, whatever you like. It need not even be the subject of your graduation. You may be a history graduate and you may choose sociology. You can choose whatever you like. You may be a doctor and you may choose anthropology for this. Any one subject you can choose. The one subject that you choose, there are two compulsory papers in that. In this, the level of the papers is, I would say, postgraduate level. Though technically speaking, they are supposed to be only graduate, but no, I would say postgraduate level. The syllabus, the, the, the syllabus is given to you uh, and uh, they are also available in any university and all that. But that if whatever subject you choose, there are two papers in that compulsory. If you choose history, then there are two papers in history. There you don't have a choice, oh, I'll choose only European history, or I'll choose Indian history, no. There's one paper on Indian history, one paper on world history, and the syllabus, which, what kind of world history is given. If it's politics you choose, political science, then there's one paper on governance and polity, and one paper on political philosophy, syllabus is given. So, you have, so those two papers are there, they are the optional papers, uh, but they're compulsory optionals, they're optional, I said, because you choose them. And then there is a very important paper, well, important, I would say, but all these papers carry 250 marks, called the essay paper. The essay paper. Now, to write the essay paper again, and the, the medium that you can choose is anything you like. Huh? You can write in English, you can write in, uh, in uh, what, any other language, any one of the Indian languages that you choose. You, you can write in Konkani, you can write in whatever you like. Okay? And they allow you to choose, you can answer your general studies and optional papers in one language and you can write your essay paper in another language also. They allow you that freedom. So you say for example you can choose English for your optional papers but you want to write the essay you can choose your mother tongue to write the essay in. If you feel that you can write better in your mother tongue. Now you have to write two essays in those three hours. They will give you six, seven topics and you have to choose two, two of those topics and you have to write two long essays, at least six, seven pages each essay. So these are the seven papers that are, that will add up for your total in the mains. There are two more papers. I told you there were nine papers. There are two more papers, but in those other two papers, you have only to qualify. You have only to pass. The marks that you get in those two are not added for your scoring. Which are those two papers? One paper in English language and one paper in any Indian language. You can choose any Indian language you like. It can be Hindi, it can be Marathi, it can be Konkani, it can be any Indian language. And the two language papers, English and that, are really language papers in the sense there's no literature involved. You are, nobody's going to ask you questions on Shakespeare or on poetry and all that over there, nothing. It's basically language comprehension, precy writing, grammar, translate, make sentences, write short paragraphs, that is it, language. And you have to score just 25% in each of those papers to qualify. They will first correct these two papers. If you qualify, only your other papers are going to be corrected. But if you don't qualify, then they won't correct your other papers. But you have to be not be frightened at all. Practically nobody fails these language papers. They are quite easy. They are quite sensible. So, uh, uh, I mean, they are just straightforward, not sensible. They are quite straightforward. So you don't have to be frightened about these language papers. 
you can choose as I say English and one any other subject everybody passes in them but the totaling for your marks to see whether you qualify to be called for the interview will be these other seven papers each of which carry 250 marks and once you qualify say come in the top 2000 then you will get a call for the interview okay now uh, how do you prepare for the IAS how do you prepare now it it depends at which stage you are if you are currently in the 11th or 12th there is one way you've got lots of time but if you are currently in your second year of college or your third year of college then you don't have very much time to prepare then you have to put in more work so it depends where you are now one part of preparation oh, father I think we are I'll try and wind up within 10 minutes and then I'll take your questions one part of preparation is the academic part of it okay your academics you have to be solid in your academics because after all look at the huge competition that is going on you know so you should be solid in whatever subject you have chosen for your graduation your graduation marks are not counted for the IAS but at the same time you will be choosing a subject no so you can't just keep studying everything anew so you have to be a good student you don't necessarily have to be at the top of your class standing first all the time if you are well and good but even if not but you have to be towards the top of your class you know in the top 10 percent 15 percent of your class so you should be having a good academic grounding and you should be willing to work towards that but academics alone is not going to get you through the IAS you see you need also to be an all-round personality and why am I telling you you need I'll tell you the reason so you have to read widely not just your course material don't stick only to only your course material you have to be reading you have to be seeing what is happening you have to see films you have to see you know whether whatever films you like of course you don't have to take them as gospel truth everything you see you should have to be able to discern what you're seeing but you should read widely you should have a lot of general knowledge and you should have general interests you have some hobby some other interest apart even sports anything you like no you don't have to be you know only that but apart from academics you have to have other interests for two reasons the reason is that these other interests will give you will set your answers apart you see everybody is going to be studying that syllabus everybody is going to be reading those same textbooks that you are that that, that, that you are reading how are you going to shine differently when the, those examiners are looking at your answers how are you going to shine out you can shine out when you add something different to your answers now that little different that you add to your answers will not come from your textbooks they have to come from magazines from the editorials of some newspaper or listening to some debate on 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 TV or participating somewhere else that little extra that you add in that 5% extra that you add into your answers is what is going to make it different and stand out and the examiners will say yes this student is to be marked higher again this will also come in use in your interview which carries also 250 marks and you may say well out of 2000 marks because seven papers 250 each is 1750 and interviews 250 and you may say you know what is the interview only carries 250 marks but actually the interviews make or break because in that 1750 everybody at each total you will find a, a, a crowding of numbers at 1700 you will find 30 people getting that same number of marks at 1000 uh, at uh, 1630 uh, uh, you'll find another 30 people getting the same mark so in the interview is what will be make or break that it's on every mark there are so many students who get in from the person who tops to the person who's at the bottom there may be a range of only 40 or 50 marks out of 2000 the difference in, in uh, of, of, of uh, the topper and the person who's at the bottom of the list so 
that interview gives you a chance to shine out and in the interview they are not going to ask you questions on your course on history and geography and they're not going to be asked all that is tested in your written exams thoroughly in your interview they are looking at your aptitude at your attitude and don't go by all those fake whatsapp messages and videos that this is an ias question how many steps did you climb and how many all that is rubbish they are they all fake the panel that interviews a one hour interview almost 45 minutes to one hour and a panel of 6 to 8 people are interviewing you from different fields they come from different fields 6 or 8 people and they are not there to trick you but they are there to judge your attitude and your aptitude and what you have written in your form in your application form about your interests about your hobbies these are the things that they will ask you about so if you if you don't have any interests and you are unable to fill in your form those this is my interest whether it is poetry whether it is music whether it is football whether it is anything if you are unable to write anything there they are unable to ask you questions and elicit what is best in you of course you can't write rubbish in that because they will ask you a question and if they find that you are talking that you haven't told the truth then you'll go down because they are looking for honesty they are looking for integrity and they are looking for a balanced personality that is they may ask you a view on a controversy now they cannot they need not be a right view or a wrong view but they want to see whether you can argue your view without being stubborn but yet can you reasonably argue to defend your view and a commitment to constitutional values and what are our constitutional values democracy equality secularism fraternity these are our constitutional values so your commitment to these values and your readiness for public service this is what they try to judge in your interview and the, therefore getting preparing for the interview is something which you can't you see you can prepare within 2 weeks 3 weeks on how to present yourself etc but all this background information these hobbies are all you can't develop in 2 weeks they are they go over years therefore i am saying you have to try and develop your personality in a multifaceted way so you give those panelists a chance to get out the best in you now i had uh, to talk about the training of the ias but i'm not going to do that because we are off time during question session if anybody wants to know then i will talk about what training is done it's quite exciting quite interesting but let's see later on so the, i will only wind up this with 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 two or three uh, words of advice to you one is if you are serious about a career in the civil services then you must read widely read from now read whatever you like read novels read books but certainly read the editorial pages of good newspapers because just reading the news is important make that a habit but by the time you appear for the exam international relations will have changed but whatever happens even in the future is based on what is happening now so keep up with the news but read the editorials of good newspapers read some good magazines so you need to widen your horizons keep up that habit second uh learn to write a little neatly and write fast you see and why i'm saying this because now all of us have got into the habit of using the computer i myself find that my handwriting has deteriorated because i'm so used to using to writing now only on the computer but when you are writing in the exam they don't allow you to use the computer you have to write by hand and your essays the in if your the the essay papers and your answers in the two optional papers you have to write by long hand if your writing is not you didn't have to be a grand handwriting but it should be a legible handwriting if your handwriting is illegible people uh, illegible the examiner is just going to score you low also if you write very slowly you are not able to write the number of pages that are required you can't get away with writing you know just two paragraphs three paragraphs or one or two pages you have to write a good amount so get into that habit i know in school in colleges also you are answering your papers but be careful a little bit about handwriting and writing fast 
keep yourself up to date for logical thinking and analysis by doing puzzles and brain teasers. These are all important things. They help you think, you know. They help you think. And uh, I would say that though you are allowed six attempts and nine attempts if you belong to a reserved category, you really shouldn't be wasting your time. I've come across people who say, no, no, sir, I'm sitting for the fourth time, the fifth time. I would say, give it three shots at the most. If you don't get in in three shots, it means that you are not cut out for the civil services and you should not be wasting your time. You should be looking then for a new, for another career. Also, also, this is a personal choice of yours, but it's my advice, don't sit idle at home. Again, when even I've sat on interview panels by taking interviews uh, and if you ask a person, you know, what are you doing now? And if that person says, no, sir, I, I, I am preparing for the UPSC exams. I'm not doing anything. You actually cut a bit of a sorry figure. Your grading comes down. You can't just sit, it's okay, two months, three months, you sit at home to study, that's fine. But you can't just finish your studies and then spend two years studying at home and not doing anything else, no. My advice is, go out and get a job. One of the best jobs to get is teaching because you are in touch with academics then and you are, have access to the library and you have time to study and prepare for yourself or any other job which gives you time to study and prepare, but do something because that also develops your personality. You need to do something. Uh, don't just sit at home and say, I'm preparing. Sometimes people for three years don't do anything and they're only sitting at home. My advice is that is not something good to do. So yeah, uh, I've actually uh, finished, apart from talking about training, I've finished giving you an overview. So I'm open to questions, any kind of questions you want to ask, no problem. Just raise your hand and ask me questions, even if it's relating to something I've said, or something out, whatever you like. Yeah, loudly, just talk loudly so that everyone hears your question, yes. Training. I'll talk about training, but I just want to get elicit one or two. Uh, you want me to tell you about the training part or? Okay. <laughs> no. Now, the, the, the training of an IAS officer is also very good training. It's called a sandwich training. It's a two-year training. You are trained for two years in a sandwich course. And what is meant by a sandwich course? I'll tell you. There's training in the academy, there's field work, and then again, there's training in the academy. That's why it's called a sandwich training. You begin, uh, the academy is in Masuri. It's called the Lal Bahadur Shastri National Academy of Administration. Beautiful academy. Uh, it, it's obviously completely free. You don't have to pay for the training. In fact, they'll be begin paying you your salary when, when you are there already. Now, in the, the first three and a half months of your training is what is called a foundation course. In the foundation course, everybody is there, all the services. So there's the IAS, the IPS, the foreign service, the audit and accounts and everybody excepting the forest because for the forest service the preliminary exam is the same but then the structure of their papers is different because they are a technical service they have to sit for botany zoology etc and uh, their training is in 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 the national forest academy in Dehradun. but they come for their foundation course also to masuri so all the services have their foundation course together in this foundation course, there are certain subjects which you have to study, law, economics, something, some basic things, and uh, also current affairs. They invite a lot of good speakers, uh, top speakers, both from the country and from outside, from industry, from politics, to talk to you, to interact. Your day begins early at, you know, 5.30 in the morning, and you have yoga, and then you have compulsory horse riding. You have to learn to ride a horse. And then you come back, then you have your breakfast, then you have classes. And uh, then there is the ante room. The ante room is a very interesting thing. It's outside the mess. There's a small like a room, it's called the ante room. And the, 
whichever speakers they call and invite in the day to come and give you a lecture or something, those speakers come and have dinner with you and then they come to the ante room after dinner and you can just pick up a cup of coffee etc and sit around and interact on a personal level with these people, whoever they are, I mean whether it may be a minister, maybe somebody else. When I was in the academy one Sunday suddenly without any notice, we just got 15 minutes notice after breakfast and they said, you know, we are having a special guest for lunch and uh, then after that there will be interaction and the special guest was the Prime Minister. Indira Gandhi came there and she just interacted and it was all, of course things are different now because of security reasons and all, but this, there's all this part and then there is trekking, they take you for two long treks into the Himalayas for about four days each, unless you have a health problem, you go on for these treks. So this is the the foundation course and friend, the, the idea of the foundation course is to establish friendships and contacts across services. So when I talk about 1980 batch, I know people in the 1980 batch not only who are in the IAS but who are in the other services also. And all this comes in use later on in administration, in coordinating, in, in, you know, in, uh, in pushing things through in ministries, etc. Now when that foundation course is over, then every service goes to its own place of training. The police people go to their National Police Academy in Hyderabad. The foreign service people will go to the National Forest, uh, 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 National Foreign Service uh, Academy which is in Delhi. The railway traffic people will go to uh, Baroda where the railway traffic training college is. The income tax people will go to Nagpur where they, the, the, the training college for income tax and, uh, and uh, customs and excise is in Nagpur. But the IAS continue in Masuri for their phase one. The phase one is again another four or five months training, which the rest of the routine continues to be the same, horse riding and uh, yoga and all that business early in the morning. And then academics, certain subjects which you have to study in greater detail, Constitution of India, some more economics, some management, etc. And the langu languages, the, because when you are allotted to a state cadre, uh, that also, this, you see, uh, depending on your rank, you can uh, ask for which cadre you want. And depending on the vacancies in that cadre for that year, there may be four vacancies in, if you want, you can choose Karnataka, you can choose Telangana, you can choose Bengal, you can choose Haryana, Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, whatever you like. Goa doesn't have a separate cadre because it's too small to have a cadre. You see, you've got to have, see Goa has only about 30 IAS officers. You can't offer career progression for 30 officers. You've got to have at least 100 officers. Like Madhya Pradesh has 350 IAS officers. Uttar Pradesh also has 380 IAS officers. Gujarat has 200 IAS officers. Maharashtra has uh, 280 IAS officers. So you've got to have at least 100 IAS officers to offer you career progression, right from your SDO right up to chief secretary. Now Goa has only about 25 to 30 IS officers, so that doesn't work. So Goa is part of the Agmut Kada. The Agmut Kada is Arunachal, Goa, uh, Manipur, no Manipur is part of Manipur Tripura uh, and Meghalaya is part of Assam Meghalaya. So what is the M in the Agmut? Mizoram, <laughs> you're right, Mizoram. So uh, Goa, Abama. Um, uh, Arunachal, Goa, Mizoram and the Union Territories, you know, Pondicherry and Chandigarh and Daman and Diu, etc. So that is part of one cadre, so that is a, a little uh, an issue, uh, but I mean you don't have to opt for Goa cadre, you can opt for any cadre you like, like I, I got Madhya Pradesh cadre even though I, I am a Goan and I studied in Maharashtra but I got Madhya Pradesh, so whatever. So if you are going to a cadre, the language of which you don't know, then you have to study that language, which they have wonderful language labs and everything in over there. So you study that language because all of us do our work. Now Goa works largely in English, but in the other states, uh, they work in the language of the state. In Madhya Pradesh, I only worked in Hindi. In Bengal, they only work in Bengali. So uh, you have to learn the language of the state, okay? And then they have at the end of that phase one, they have something very fascinating in the IAS called the Bharat Darshan. The Bharat Darshan for two months or two and a half months, it takes you around India 
for one is they they take you and you do a certain amount of sightseeing and all for you know certain states etc and then you have a lot of attachments you have an army attachment a two week army attachment you are with the army in a frontier area i went to arunachal pradesh said arunachal pradesh or uh, kashmir or somewhere and you stay in barracks you stay on the frontier you know you sleep in tents they teach you to use uh, guns they they you have to go with them uh, on treks uh, and i remember when i was in arunachal and the captain who was in charge of us uh, we were crossing on a rope bridge we were crossing a uh, uh, a river and he said you see if uh, if you start losing your balance give the gun to the person at the back of you and fall but don't drop the gun he says the gun is more precious than you are so anyway of course which really wasn't true but they 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 uh, they they take care of you also but you get that whole experience of the of army life in in a frontier area then you have a civil defense attachment in nagpur so with the civil defense services then we have a um, an industry attachment with the public sector then we have an agriculture attachment with an agriculture university uh, i remember in ludhiana again so and then they have a tribal attachment in a tribal area where they'll go and they'll just leave you there you know in a group of four four each and you are just left there for 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 a for a week and you got to do a survey and some rations you'll be sleeping in the school school building of that village and you'll be bathing at the well and you one of you will stay back every day and cook food for the others while the others do the survey so you take that in turns and you have to communicate somehow or the other because you don't know the language of those of of those but and then you have to report on your survey findings uh, later so it's all very fascinating it's a good training and it's a solid training then you go to your state for one year where you are assistant collector and then you learn your state laws and state things and then you come back for phase 2 at the end of one year so that's a whole two year training so good solid training that you're given and they equip you then for the rest of your career but now questions <laughs> yes see uh, as i said you have to have uh, you therefore i always say you should work and don't sit at home not doing anything because if you don't get in you can try a second time and if you still don't get in or get into any service at all perhaps you should you know you have you should have a fall back career what you would like to do now, i had my i i was clear about my fall back career i would like to go i would have gone into academics actually my first love is architecture but since i didn't do architecture then i couldn't start architecture at the end after finishing my post graduation but then i wanted to go into research so i wanted to go into academics but you can go you can have whatever option you like you see you can say do an mba if you don't get do an mba which is fine after your grad and do something there but you need to have a fall back career don't say nothing this or nothing else because you see there's a lot of chance and a lot of luck also involved and if you don't get selected you must have a fall back and if you take these long breaks of 2 years and 3 years in between then you are you know you're not equipped to face life after that so you need to do that sorry there was a question please pardon me ja uh, again on in your own state see not not absolutely true see in the the ias is also designed to keep the country together so when they select uh, a number of people from the only one third of those vacancies can be occupied by people from their own from your own state so say in a particular year if there are six vacancies in uh, maharashtra then only two will be kept aside for people from maharashtra and four will have to come from people outside maharashtra so you can get your home state but you have to then be the topper in your state because uh, you know uh, two or three vacancies uh, are there depending on the number of sometimes up and all have large enough 15 vacancies some states it depends you see how many people have retired from the ias in that year and every state has a fixed cadre a sanctioned cadre strength 
So, you can get into your own state, but it is not necessary that you get it. And apart from this insider, outsider, there is also the reservation system also working side by side. So, you have uh, uh, 25 percent of the seats reserved for SC, ST and the two are combined and then if there is a fraction, the fraction is carried over to the next year. So, you may get your home state, you may not get your home state, but I tell you there is, when I went to Madhya Pradesh, I did not know anything about Madhya Pradesh. I had never lived in Madhya Pradesh. I had never even visited a tourist spot in Madhya Pradesh. I had never gone. Madhya Pradesh was only a place where if you went by train outside Maharashtra and you crossed you into Delhi, the train went through and that also in the night. So, I knew nothing about Madhya Pradesh. But you know, once I went there and when I got there, I also was apprehensive. You know, why did I not get Maharashtra because I had grown up there or whatever, whatever. But once you actually begin uh, in your state, I think, you know, after about 10 years, you ask everybody in the batch, people who have gone to states which were not their home state. And I would say that 99 percent of them will say, we are not only extremely happy in our state, we do not want to change it now. You know, I always say that getting into a state is something like, uh, you know, uh, an arranged marriage. You know, before before you are married, everybody dreams, you know, I only want to marry Aishwarya Rai and I want to marry somebody else and like that. But once you are married, after two or three or four years, you say, no, no, change your spouse. What would you say? No, I am in love with my spouse. So, it is like that. So, you should not be very frightened about going to a state. Now, people are saying, oh, Northeast, Northeast. People who have gone to the Northeast have loved it so much friendly people, loving people, beautiful state to travel in, do all your field postings in. For the first 10 years, you will be doing field postings, you see. And in many of these other states are very large states. So, uh, those, the, the villages, the, the, the countryside and all are beautiful. So, I do not think you should worry very much. Yes, you can have your options that I would like. And you can give your options. When you fill up your form, they will ask you for options, which cadres you would like to and then in, depending on your rank and the number of vacancies and you get your choice. So, seems like all of you are equipped to sit for the exam. <laughs> no doubts, no questions. See, the study material, I, I would say, uh, you have to, uh, I, I, uh, the, the UPSC does not prescribe any study material. But for all your general study papers, I would say the NCERT books for the 12th standard published by the NCERT, the, uh, for generally they are CBSE textbooks, those you should uh, use to even to refresh your memory. And then, the look at the books, the subject that you choose for the optionals, look at the books prescribed by a standard university, a good university. Uh, look at the books that they have prescribed for study in that subject. Use those. Okay? And, uh, you know, I mean, standard ones for Indian history, Bipin Chandra, Romila Thapar, these are, uh, you know, um, uh, good books. Uh, Basham, the wonder that is India, the making of India. So, uh, when you are actually into that, yes, books can, there are, you have to search and nowadays the net is available to search for these books. You know, when we appeared, there was no internet, you had to. Look. So, uh, at this stage, it depends at what stage you are. If you are in a, yet in the, you know, in school or in just your first or second year of graduation, do not worry about other textbooks. Focus on your studies at the moment and general reading. But yes, as you reach closer to the exam, and it is a good idea, it is not necessary, but it is a good idea to do a post-graduation, you see, and appear for the exam while you are doing your post-graduation. Because, as I told you, you can apply and you can sit for the exam the very year that you 
actually uh, pass out from uh, you, once you've done your final year graduation even if the results are not out you can apply but it may not be a very good idea you see because the level though they say graduation is higher so i would always advise that the subject that you are planning to take as your optional do a post graduation in that subject and while you are doing your post graduation prepare for the ias and sit for the even after your first year ma or first year msc you know sit for the exam and the, in any case the selection procedure is a year long by then you will finish your post graduation also so i would generally advise that and if you say no 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 i am not interested in academics even though, then if you are not so interested in academics then perhaps you are not cut out for this exam because you need to do you need to study so i always advise people to go in for a post graduation and prepare during their post grad post graduation and then you have access to library and all as a student and you know you can the preparation becomes easier any other questions yeah pardon me my idea of those who want to pursue need to have an analytical ability you see because an analytic what is been analytical ability is nothing there is a big word for just common sense but not only common sense you should have common sense but you should be able to reason out things yes and you have to be able it's extremely important to see both sides of a problem whether it is in writing your essay problem uh, paper whether it is in interacting in your interview whether it is in writing your answers to your subject paper whether it's history or sociology or anthropology you should be able to see two sides of a problem and you should be able to argue both sides just like when you do debates in school no you have a, a proposition and people are arguing for and people are arguing against one day you may be this side the other day you may be that side so there is no need you see you should hold passionate views for yourself but you should be able to argue like a lawyer can argue both sides so you should those are exercises that you can do for yourself even if you take a controversial issue something that's very obvious and you think no the right thing is this yes so you should have a view a moral view that the right thing is there you should argue for it but as a training argue even for the opposite and see whether you can put together cogent arguments for the opposite that helps you reason out and you see most things in life are gray there are very few things that are black and white everything is gray and you should be able to argue through that and that will help you also analyze and numerical and analytical uh, uh, ability is developed through doing brain teaser puzzles keep doing them try work out you know uh, series and various things that helps you analyze too yes no nothing at all nothing at all you can choose any center to appear from there are no quotas kept for anybody from you know any state nothing in admission you come from wherever anywhere doesn't help you at all uh because even the exams there are well supervised in their centers in every state there's probably just one center and they are very strict about cheating and all that so if you think that oh, if i apply from patna maybe i'll be able to cheat it may not be possible because they bring in people from outside and there is police force and there's only one center you see one or two centers max uh, in some big cities like delhi and bombay they may have three four centers but they're all well policed so no and uh, in selection nobody knows which state you are from or which center you've sat from all that is all that only comes out in the interview you know where did you do your graduation where do you come from and what are the problems of that area etc which is long down you reach the final stage pardon me 
See, training would help. I would say, I, I myself never went for any classes, but I, I would say yes. But I would not actually opt for these, you know, three year long trainings and they are only actually people are making money on that. But yes, a final training to help you polish up and prepare for the exam. Uh, yes, and also if you get through uh, to, the, to the, the mains and are called for an interview, yes, then some month long training uh, focusing on how to appear for interviews, that would help. And if you see, uh, even while you are doing your graduation, uh, even for two years before that, a full-time course I would never advise. They are just too expensive and they are worthless. But yes, if you are willing to devote, uh, say, once a week or something for a certain session to do that extra work, yes. That kind of training can help you focus, one, and it helps you meet other like-minded people who are also sitting for the exam and that personal interaction also helps. But you have to choose this carefully, you know, not just go in for any coaching class like that and, you know, they charge you huge sums of money and that uh, it's more important, your own work is more important. Yes. See, actually, that's what I said in the beginning, you know, unfortunately, uh, Goans are not sitting for the exam. Uh, that's why they are not qualifying. Uh, if Goans kept in adequate numbers, we wouldn't even have had to have a talk like this over here, you see. And this is unfortunate because Goans are well educated and you have we have, uh, uh, you know, uh, the correct raw material and the more uh, people sit, uh, I was uh, talking to somebody and they said, you see, maybe about 100, 150 people are sitting for the exam even every year, which is meaningless. We should have at least a thousand people sitting for the exam. Yes. Pa pardon me? What has become a hindrance? In school yeah. uh, or in college? See, now of course, I, these are things that you can't do anything about. I mean, the syllabus that you already have, you have to deal with that. Uh, I cannot really comment on the, on the, 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 the rationality or the use of that syllabus, but one has to deal with that. No other question? I, I, I'm surprised. I always thought that I would get a question on how do you deal with political pressure and what does one do? But apparently all of you are quite comfortable with, <laughs> with <laughs> that. So anyway, yes. Uh, I, not necessarily, but they are, all, for one thing is they are large states, their populations are large uh, and a lot of people sit for the exam. Not everyone is serious, but still a lot of people are sitting there, you see. So the more people that sit the, on, on, on a, just a simple question of averages, you will get more people selected. In, in the north of India, people are more, mm, you know, uh, uh, geared toward this exam. Unfortunately, in, in Western India, there is not so much interest in Goa, but I also include Maharashtra and Gujarat. I mean, when I sat in college for the exam, and I was from St. Xavier's in Bombay, in the whole college, there were only three of us who sat for the exam. Whereas if you look at St. Stephen's in Delhi and all that, 250 people sitting, 300 people sitting. So yes, more people in the north and in Tamil Nadu and Karnataka seem to be, and, and in the south, seem to be sitting. But in Western India, maybe also culturally because options are more in Bombay, in Gujarat, for business, for industry. So they go in for management, perhaps, perhaps. So it offers better job opportunities 
so that may be the reason for people not sitting. But I would ge genuinely love if you know even one of you get in. I think I will think that the effort today was worth it. Yes. See, uh, I'm not trying to poo-poo that. Yes, dealing with corruption is is difficult. But remember that when you are in the IAS, you yourself are in a position of power. And I would say that an IAS officer who says I can't do anything about corruption is a fake. Yes, a clerk. My, my, if a clerk in an office or a head clerk or a section officer says, you know, it's difficult, I can understand his or her problems. But an IAS officer who has so, many, so much power and is at such a senior level, if he says or she says, I can't do anything about corruption, then that person is not fit to be where that person is. Now, having said that, yes, you can get pressures from the top, from ministers, from this, from that. But then, you see, I also ask you, I, I'm not saying it's easy to deal with it. But I also ask you, is there any profession that is there without tensions, without difficulty? If someone says, I want to join the army, uh, you know, what do you say? But if there's a war, what happens? If there's a war, there's a war. You go to the front and you should be ready to die. You should be ready, not that you should want to die. Like General Patton said, you know, you, uh, you should live for your country and make the other guy, he didn't say guy, he said, <laughs> he said another word, but I don't want to say it here. But he said, you should make that guy uh, die for his country, <laughs> your, uh, the, 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 the enemy. But whatever it is, I'm saying every job, even if you're a doctor, engineer, now what did the doctors face when the pandemic was going on? But they had to do their job. So every job has its uh, uh, difficulties, but you are also in a position to deal with that and you have to be steadfast. After all, as you were saying, transferred here, transferred there. So what? You should be ready to take that transfer. The government will pay you for that transfer. They will pay you to transfer all your goods. You will get a house in that other place. As an IAS officer, you will get a house wherever you are posted. You know, it's not like a, like, like a teacher or, or, a, or, 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 a, or a nurse who is transferred in a rural area. At that level, they find difficulties. But as an IAS officer, wherever they post you, you will get a house and they will pay you for your transfer. Yes, you may not be in a plum posting and at a particular point of time, but you should be willing to take that. The moment uh, the political executive knows that you are willing to do that, they will not even push you. And I will also say another thing, an efficient officer, if you are able to demonstrate your efficiency, ultimately even the political executive will want you because they have to show results. If they don't show results, they will not get re-elected. So good officers, if you, you know, they used to tell us in the academy, in the first five years, you make or break your entire career. You build up a reputation in the first five years and you'll find good postings coming your way, maybe an aberration here or there, and you will be able to face up also to that kind of pressure. It's not, so, it's not impossible. I think we are done, Father. There are no more questions. We are uh, okay. Last question. Uh, see, you'll have to just put the thing so I can see. Sorry. In the preliminary exam, in the main exam, there are four general knowledge papers. Not essay. The, the last one is ethics and integrity. Essay paper is a different paper altogether. So the first one is focuses on history, geography. The second one focuses on politics and governance. The third one on science, technology, environment. Uh, and the fourth one on ethics, integrity and aptitude. Four, G, four general study papers. Essay paper, 
two subject, two papers in the subject that you choose and two languages. For the GS, as I said to you, uh, it has to be, uh, I mean, from just the, uh, the information knowledge part, it has to be 12th standard level. History, geography and all 12th standard. But current affairs and all is whatever is happening around you, you see, and environment, you should know whatever is happening in waste management and not the technical details, but the relevant social impacts of these things, you see, uh, solar energy, uh, energy consumption, green practices, that kind. <laughs> Actually very difficult to say, every time, every level, I mean when I was collector uh, in Chindwara, I was collector for three years and Chindwara was a lovely district. So, I enjoyed because you have a lot of autonomy, uh, being housing commissioner I enjoyed very much there too, I was three and a half years and I like, you know, I like building, I like town planning, so as housing commissioner of Madhya Pradesh uh, and I was able to do a lot, bring in a lot of good housing, etc. Then in the commerce ministry and in the environment ministry, two of my central postings, I enjoyed that very much because when I was in the environment ministry a long time ago, 30 years ago, I, I was able to uh, uh, be part of the delegation that went to Rio de Janeiro, that negotiated our climate change convention, that negotiated the biodiversity convention and that negotiated the Montreal Protocol. And then in the commerce ministry later on, which was more recent, I was uh, dealing with WTO negotiations. So that was very interesting. And of course, as, uh, then as a food, as food, and you know, food was an area that I was not really very interested in. And when I was transferred back to Madhya Pradesh, I became additional chief secretary, not chief secretary, and I was put in charge of food. And Madhya Pradesh has a huge wheat procurement, wheat and rice procurement program. In fact, so much wheat is grown in, uh, you know, is grown in Madhya Pradesh and only 20% of it is consumed for Madhya Pradesh's own requirement. 80% of it is procured and goes into the uh, FCI, the Food Corporation of India, through which ration shops are supplied with wheat and uh, rice. Of course, we are not such a big rice growing, but more wheat growing. But that, that wheat and rice that is given to ration shops throughout the country to deficit states. So when I came in for to food, I uh, initially I was not so in, so, but then it posed a, a, a wonderful challenge. And that challenge was, how would you computerize the whole, uh, the procurement system was in a mess first, you know. People buying and used to buy here, there, everywhere, farmers standing in line for weeks trying to sell their produce, it was riddled with corruption. Having taken that produce, you don't know where to store it because the procurement season is April and May and then the rains come in June and then the, the, the wheat starts rotting. How do you transport it? And the, 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 the numbers are mind-boggling. Huh? We procure 80 million tons of wheat. So, now I was faced with that challenge and we had a very good team and we decided to computerize the whole system, computerize, I, I have no time to talk, there's a whole separate talk together, but we were able to computerize the procurement, the storage, the transportation and reduce corruption hugely and we trained, we had right round Madhya Pradesh some 5,000 procurement centers and in villages even sometimes where there was no electricity we had to train people to how to use computers and we did that and we were able to then that became a model it was called e uparjan uparjan is the hindi word for procurement so it was e procurement and then that became the a model which was then followed in other states so that was of course very challenging and then of course when I was chief secretary also, I, I was three and a half years chief secretary. That was multifaceted because you're dean. So really I mean career is something that uh, you need to enjoy every part of your career. If you're not enjoying your career then uh, it's, it's unfortunate. So you need, to, you need to come into the IAS if you enjoy public service. The IAS will give you a lot of compensations. It will give you power, it will give you prestige and the pay is good. So, you won't be rolling in money, you won't have money like if you were in the private sector, which pays much better, but they take care of you. So yes, that is, but if that is the only attraction, then perhaps public service is not for you. You should also have a desire to make things better, to make things better for society, 
and to have an option for the poor, the deprived, because they are all you have. You see, people who are well off have lots of godfathers, but those who are poor, those who are exploited, you don't see many of them in a state like Goa, but if you're posted in other large states which have deep interior areas, whether you're in Bihar or Madhya Pradesh or Rajasthan or Andhra Pradesh or whatever, you'll find that there is a lot of poverty in villages, a lot of exploitation, and you are the only one whom they have, whom they can turn to, uh, because they, are, they, they face a lot of, you know, uh, exploitation from sections in society and from uh, politicians, lower level politicians who are hand in glove with them. And so you have to have a desire to serve them, to root out corruption, to see that government programs reach the, the, the people they are meant for and that this will give you tremendous job satisfaction too. We are done.